Can everyone see this? I, uh, and maybe just to very, very quickly return to the, the question of the last gentleman, um, I, I forgot your name from Brussels. Um, from my opinion, I have a background in economics. I think one of the reasons that there is uh, more of a focus on this type of synergy is just the sort of first mover advantage of the Ricardian uh, notion of, of uh, comparative advantage. I think that's, that's what's uh, sort of um, the cause of this uh, lack of creativity. That's my opinion. Um, but we can get to that at the discussion. So I uh, have a bit of a conceptual um, discussion. I, uh, I hope this is um, useful or interesting. I thought I would relate uh, this chapter to some of my own research and also the concepts behind that research as I've done a lot of, uh, of that in, in Italy. And so I thought this would be an opportunity to connect to some of these, in my opinion, very interesting ideas. So uh, yes, my name is Jerome. I uh, have recently been selected as the chair of the, uh, the um, yeah, what well, program of the, uh, the Belgian Sovereign Wealth Fund at the Academy Royale de Belgique. And uh, for that, or currently, I'm still also a doctoral candidate at the University of Cologne. Um, just very quickly, background, I'm German-American, uh, uh, you know, sort of world one in, in Papa's view, you know, who, who am I? Uh, I did a first bachelor's in actually a lot of humanities uh, stuff in Alabama. Uh, new college focusing on religious studies, uh, philosophy, uh, and also have been for a long time been interested in the topic of cooperation. Read uh, you know a lot of the sort of classical anarchist uh, literature, people like Kolpotkin, Rudolf Hocker, and Noam Chomsky, you know more of a modern take. And I uh, became interested in economics, particularly uh, after the 2008 and the financial crisis, and I uh, got a bachelor's in that. And uh, my thesis uh, here uh, is on basically um, social preferences. It was published in 2015. I did a master's in uh, political uh, economy within a uh, special program, pluralistic economics, and uh, also wrote a thesis on cooperatives in, in Italy, particularly, and continued this with my PhD. And now I'm working with the uh, Academy Royale de Belgique, working on a sustainable theory of the firm. And that's, by the way, there's a picture in Italy, it's in Bologna, but it doesn't really matter. So uh, I'm glad that Helen did uh, some introduction of chapter six because I don't spend a lot of time with the, the, the content, just very, very basic rudimentary introduction. Um, and uh, this is what I gather the main messages are, of course, as just said, uh, you know, everyone has their own interpretations. So I gather that uh, the main points are among others that, you know, regional development is not the same as regional development. So, you know, it depends on how one is defining it, what are the parameters, um, yeah, what is one uh, emphasizing and also de-emphasizing? So these uh, NACE codes, uh, I, I gather, Lute argues, uh, are an insufficient grounds for uh, distributing innovation funding uh, based on the very particular historical quality of the, of the regions. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, and particularly, th these are coordinated by region, whereas regions don't explain or account for innovation. So Lute says that the administrative borders, which originated for historical, historical and administrative reasons, should be examined uh, critically in terms of their functionality for innovation, particularly in a knowledge-based economy that is far more network than a political economy. So this conclusion, I guess, is the need uh, for alternative uh, parameters for innovation policy. Um, yeah, and basically the, the subsystems, the major subsystems of Northern and Southern Italy, the Mezzogiorno, and uh, yes, that, so these administrative borders uh, basically provide a poor um, uh, basis uh, of this. And um, so my own research in Italy, I've traveled a lot in the South, particularly uh, has revealed that uh, Italians in the South, uh, you know, from self, uh, uh, self statements have said that they are generally less community inclined, less trusting of government. And uh, this, by the way, applies also to bureaucracy. So I studied, for instance, one community cooperative in uh, Brindisi, uh, Legami Brindisi, where they basically have had a lot of trouble convincing the local government to basically formally uh, communicate with them and liaise with them. And so everything sort of happens under the table because the, you know, the bureaucrats sort of prefer having no contracts. So this is a very particular cultural, I would say, uh, manifestation of some of these, these, these distinctions that you see, you know, in a very formal and abstract way on these graphs here. Uh, so maybe to connect this to my own research, uh, again, I said it come from an economics uh, perspective, how can it benefit? How can economics benefit from a triple helix view? 
Uh, one thesis is that economics lacks an evolutionary perspective. Thorsten Weblen, who is pictured here on the left, of course, smoking, you know, making advertisement for the cigarette company, <laughs> is suggested in an essay, I think, 1899, that economics is not an evolutionary science, which I think is still a very, very uh, vital uh, piece of literature and still very relevant for to describe the economics discipline today. Um, and uh, it, it's my view that experimental or behavioral, what's called behavioral economics, think about Richard Thaler and nudging and these types of things, uh, has improved upon this, but it lacks basically an overarching uh, epistemic perspective so that uh, many pedagogues, uh, I've read here one wheat, for instance, has said that pedagogues, uh, or rather that he has observed that a cybernetic framing uh, of, of interactions with, among systems with using feedback is a better tool actually in terms of pedagogy, uh, teaching macroeconomics than is uh, these sort of um, accounting, cost accounting uh, version or framing of it. So uh, Lud Leidestock has suggested that uh, political economy features two opposing logics and it can be uh, ugh, supplemented with a communications view. So just a quote from the beginning of the book actually, whereas political economy can be explained in terms of two coordination mechanisms, market and governments, a knowledge-based economy is a result of three configuration mechanisms interacting and operating upon one another. Interactions among these three selection environments shape the triple helix properties in very different ways from uh, double helices. Um, and again, um, back to my interest in cooperation, how can that help? So uh, uh, Ole Peters has been, had some very, very interesting research come out in the last uh, about 10, 10 years uh, uh, from the Santa Fe Institute originally, now he's at the London Mathematical Laboratory. And uh, he and Alex Adam actually have shown that cooperation uh, is beneficial over a long time, uh, over the long term by reducing volatile outcomes. So this is just a very uh, dry uh, an analytical framework that does not include anything like ethical values, just basically sharing uh, pays out in the end. And they notice basically a problem of initiating a cooperation, which is something that, for instance, the uh, biologist uh, Edward O. Wilson has also confirmed in, in his, uh, or had confirmed in his research. So you see this manifested in this top graph, the colored uh, uh, lines, the green uh, is the non-cooperative, the blue is the cooperative outcome where people share. And at the very, very initial left bottom hand of the graph, you see that the green actually dominates. So at the very, you know, the very beginning of cooperation, actually, it is more costly to cooperate. So the problem of initiating cooperation is initiating this sort of, uh, or overcoming rather this sort of a uh, uh, short-term uh, 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 decline in welfare for cooperators, and then ensuring the long-term benefit. And I think that a triple helix model can account for the incursion of new preferences and behaviors towards constructing new, what uh, Kyriasis and Metaxas call macrocultures. And their uh, idea is represented by the bottom graph where basically say here at the beginning two individuals sort of have a new, I'm thinking of Arlo Guthrie's, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, um, Alice's restaurant, you know, if two people are singing it, then, you know, they look at them like they're crazy. And if three people are singing it and so on, they're probably gay. And, and at the end, you actually convince everyone, you know, as, as, as uh, Gandhi would say, I guess. So uh, in a very sort of uh, 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 vulgar way of representing that. So, I think that there's also a lot of potential in combining the triple helix uh, framework with something that um, that Lucio Bighiero and uh, Josef Wienand have developed, the relational economics paradigm, because they both emphasize relations among different logics and different actors. So I, again, do not go into the details of that. This is just a very cursory overview. And my sort of idea of manifesting this, 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 this transformation, this relation is, um, a cooperative and triple helix. So Lute in his book mentions that you can extend the triple helix to a quadruple or quintuple helix and, and you know, have in addition to the regulatory profit maximizing and, you know, and uh, novelty producing logics, other logics potentially. And uh, so I have just this idea I developed in my dissertation of uh, viewing um, the cooperative principles you know, by the International Cooperative uh, Alliance as uh, propensities, uh, uh, language of uh, Karl Popper. And uh, which basically are real forces that act, you know, on agents and institutions as well. Uh, you know, they're taken as, as given. And uh, this, in the second step, I uh, apply uh, something that uh, Robert Ulanovitz, who's actually here today, uh, has termed uh, process ecology. Um, I go into this in a moment. moment and uh, the key terms and concepts in that are uh, total system capacity, you know, the, the sort of throughput in the system. Uh, what uh, he calls ascendancy, the sort of the organized uh, structures within the system and then overhead, which of course, if you think about it, are very similar to some of the concepts that Lute actually develops in his book. 
um, things like the conditional entropy and uh, again, redundancy, and uh, we've been talking about the synergy. Um, so in the, in the third step, I develop a causal model or you know, the third step would be developing a causal model using existing knowledge about you know, how things in the world uh, interact and relate. Um, and of course, again, supplementing this triple helix logic with additional logic. So just, I did an example here with cooperation education as two logics. And of course, uh, on the top, you see a, um, an autocatalytic feedback loop, uh, which you know, is very just general. And this is taken from Milanovic's uh, book, I think the growth and development book. So here again, you have the profit maximizing regulatory educational and cooperative uh, logics. Uh, just very quickly, you know, what is process ecology? I think it's worthwhile uh, mentioning it. It uh, uses the concept of the aleatoric, which uh, basically epistemologically uh, relates to shifting from the, uh, the Eleatic or the, you know, uh, 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 Platonic to the uh, Elysian school, you know, of Her Heraclitus, you know, who is pictured here on the right by a uh, Belgian uh, master, uh, his name I forget. <laughs> um, anyway, maybe one of you remembers who's, who this is, this artist. So uh, the aleatoric focuses a lot on things like indeterminacy and complex chance and is uh, influenced by uh, the thoughts of Elsasser, who many of you I'm sure have heard of and read. Um, so firstly, the uh, operation, this is a quote from, from Rodanovich's uh, newer book, The Third Window, the openness, the op sorry, the, sorry, the operation of any system is vulnerable to disruption by chance events. Uh, is, is sort of the conclusion of that. And this also relates to a conclusion that in order to understand living systems, emphasis should shift away from fixed laws towards uh, the description of processes. Uh, secondly, autocatalysis, which involves non-random processes, which I've described and also a lot of us described as propensities that react, again, non-randomly to random events. So secondly, processes by mediation by other processes may be capable of influencing themselves. Uh, so relevant agencies and living systems reside more with configurations of these propensities or processes than with uh, explicit, phys explicit physical forces and or their intended objects. Thirdly, history is very important. Again, relating back to the conclusions of Olipitos and Adamu, non-ergodicity and asymmetry mean we have to think differently about, about these, uh, these systems. So systems differ from one another according to their history, some of which is recorded in their material configurations meaning that patterns and forms in living, the living realm result from transactions between agonistic tendencies, processes that are organized, uh, that are consist of organized activities are continually being eroded by dissipative losses. While these uh, tendencies oppose another in the near field, they are seen as mutually uh, obligatory under a wider vision. So again, the, you might see the relation between this and the triple helix frame. So how do I imagine this actually manifesting? I look at the case in the dissertation on, of co-op fund, I can move this to the side, sorry. Uh, which is a cooperative development fund of the largest uh, cooperative federation in Italy, uh, Lega Coop, which uh, channels 3% of all the profits of all the associated cooperatives, which are, I think, about 15,000. Am I correct? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, someone else may actually know. I, th I think it's about 15,000 cooperatives um, towards investment in development, factoring services, uh, rescue plans, many, many different things. And um, I, I, I heard the, the note about uh, that Klaus made, Klaus Krippendorf, the last time of actually iteratively subdividing these, these, these helixes down into smaller units. I thought that was a good idea. And so taking this, again, five, this uh, cooperative uh, quintuple helix with, with profit maximizing, novelty production, education, cooperation, and, and regulation, breaking it down into three, we have profit maximizing, cooperation, and education. I look at the uh, respective investment that co-op fund makes in education, which uh, includes, as I saw in their, uh, in their social report, 2 million a year, and calculate the, the, the total uh, system throughput and ascendancy uh, from, for this. I don't have the, you know, the, the, the actual math, math here, but I come up with, um, uh, with, um, with 10 million for that. Uh, and then taking the, uh, the Oh, well, the, the total system throughput I calculated from actually the profits, total profits, which I calculated to be around 8.3 billion euros uh, in 2018. Again, taking that from that, the ascendancy, I get 10 million, actually rather the ascendancy, which relates to what is being used for education, I get 10 million. Just, uh, um, I'm subtracting the, the ascendancy from the overhead, excuse me, the ascendancy from the, sorry, from the capacity, I get the overhead, which represents unchanneled forces, uh, can be can represent things like qualitative change or things like a potential energy in the system, 
and I have 1.5 million from that. You don't have to use these numbers. This is just a sort of a thought experiment that I did. And um, my conclusion is that a higher system throughput by, for instance, doing what Piero Amirato has called for, increasing the 3% to 5% or even 8%, or increasing the relative spending on education can actually unlock more unchanneled force from education. So that could go towards uh, novelty production or you know, one of these other um, logics. Um, and my conclusion is the uh, idea of a mission-oriented economy that, for instance, Mariana Mazzucato calls for as a solution towards the wicked problems of the present, which she, you know, her, her, her uh, a quote, um, things like climate catastrophe and inequality uh, require a mission-oriented uh, economy. And the example you know, of these missions could be the sustainable development goals of the UN, other things. Uh, I look at, for instance, Lega Coop, uh, whose former president, who was also the minister of labor in Italy, uh, suggested had an idea of community development, but no examples. So I, again, and my partner uh, took a trip to Apulia in the south of Italy uh, and visited some of the about a dozen or half a dozen of their community cooperatives, which again uh, were sort of live living examples of this interaction, these synergetic interactions of different logics, uh, which include again, making a profit, but also include you know, things like community development. So I see these as living manifestations of, this, of, this, um, of these synergies. Uh, so they began in 1991 with the Valle di Cavalieri, which actually was in Emilia Romagna in the middle of nowhere, and culminated in the first formal community cooperative uh, based on the first regional law of community cooperation in 2014. Again, as an example of uh, sort of the, the re mutual reinforcement of government regulating with, you know, sort of um, a cooperative logic, as well as this you know, logic of creating a profit because this project was actually involved in Meritignano with putting uh, solar panels on uh, the roofs of the homes of citizens rather than putting them somewhere in a farm outside of the town, destroying the ambience there. Um, and again, at, at present, there are almost 200 community cooperatives in Italy. The rate is going upwards quite quickly. The latest legislation is in Alto Arice or Sutiro, uh, actually developed in January of this year. Um, um, with colleagues uh, of mine in Trento as well, um, including Carlo Bozaga. And so uh, there are lots of other examples of this type of synergistic interaction of logics. I look at another example in my dissertation of circles. It's an alternative currency in Berlin, SMART, which is a new cooperative that started in Belgium actually for freelancers, uh, which are trying to include sort of a, 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 an internal market for services, uh, which I think could be a great manifestation of this sort of cooperative uh, synergistic logic. And the question for, for me and for my uh, work, future work at the Academy Royale de Belgique is how does one integrate these types of uh, logics into uh, firm cost accounting, which I think would be a very interesting approach to, again, translating some of these uh, very important missions downwards into firm, firm activity. So I mean, these are the works that I've cited in addition to Lutz's book, which I don't mention here. So that's it.